Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on uh, Vocational and Education uh, Training Week, together with Eurocommerce and the European Movement International. I'm Christelle Delberg, Director General of Eurocommerce, and I will be introducing this session. Vocational and education training programs are very important. They provide students with essential skills, they enhance their employability, they support their professional development, but they also contribute to companies' competitiveness and they offer many advantages for retailers and wholesalers. Attra attracting and retaining talent and skills today is an essential part of building economic resilience and the transformation. We welcome the Commission's focus during this week, this particular week, and the European Year of Skills, and we hope that the movement towards vocational and educational training will continue. Eurocommerce, we are, um, we are the European Umbrella Association for Retail and Wholesale. Our sector represents is the first largest private employer in Europe with no less than 26 million Europeans working in our sector. And we are also one of the sectors that attracts young people, as one in five young Europeans starts their career in retail and wholesale. Retailers and wholesalers offer multiple opportunities, mainly for local jobs, including in rural areas, stable and specialized jobs, varied, like direct selling, like in brick and mortar stores, like in online retail, and offer also very transferable skills. Today, we're in the midst of a skills and crisis and a talent battle. Many industries are looking for talent to fill new roles, but in our sector, this is particularly acute. More than 40% of respondents to a survey last year cited difficulty finding talent with the right skills to lead um, the digital and sustainability transformation as a major difficulty. This comes on, on top of the fact that our sector has long been faced facing a skills shortage in many, many areas, such as IT specialists, such as lorry drivers, or in-store staff, including bakers and butchers. Of course, this is without mentioning the lack of the general lack of digital skills. The situation for SMEs, so small and medium sized enterprises, is particularly worrying. A recent Eurobarometer on skill shortages, recruitment and retention strategies and in SMEs reveals that skills shortages hold back business activities for 63% of SMEs. They also inhibit their efforts on digitalization for 45% for SMEs and greening. The sector we've had five to 10 years ago is vastly different from the sector we have today. And it will be completely different in 10 years time. There's an acute need for modernized vocational and education training systems, taking into account our current and future skills needs of retailers and wholesalers and deliver on continuous learning, upskilling and retail and, and reskilling. At Eurocommerce, we're committed to advance the skills agenda and have joined efforts. We have joined a skills partnership together with our trade union partner, Uni Europa. We're also looking forward to working with the European Commission on the follow-up to the industry strategy, which will resu result in an actionable plan to improve the future resilience, sustainability, and digitalization of the retail ecosystem. We are pleased that this process will focus on skills and labor shortages, and we call for action and commitments by companies, education providers, and governments to make the changes needed to be fit and ready for the future. The webinar today is a chance to discuss vocational training, vocational skills, but also the need for nurturing a culture of lifelong learning so that we can match the needs for our retail and wholesale companies 
with the education and the training paths that can lead and support employees. My colleague Lena Whitaker will be leading, uh, moderating the discussion. And now I'm very pleased to pass on the floor to Aimé Duprat Maccabees from the European Movement International. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Christelle, and thank you all for joining this joint event organized with Eurocommerce in the context of the GT Week. I'm Aimé Duprat, Policy and Advocacy Officer at EMI. And I want to extend my thanks again to Eurocommerce for the organization of this very timely event and also for the successful partnership that we have with them. So I'll shortly introduce the European Movement International, for those of you who might not know it. Uh, so we are the largest pan-European network of organizations dedicated to advancing European integration, cooperation and unity. We have a history going back to 1948 and we are now present in more than 34 European countries. We have a diverse membership that's composed uh, of both national branches and international organizations. And those range from civil society organizations, youth organizations, NGOs, trade unions, academia, um, to the four main uh, pro-European political parties. The topic of skills in education is extremely important for organizations, especially at such a time of labor shortages and scale gaps in our uh, European economies, as Crystal mentioned. And already back in uh, 2017, we developed a policy position on the topic of youth unemployment and skills, where we strongly highlight the need to link uh, education to the labor market. And in this respect, vocational education and training, so VET, is an excellent opportunity for work-based learned uh, learning experiences, especially in countries where it has uh, not been yet well uh, established. And if VET offers a dual objective, contributing to employability and economic, economic growth while responding to uh, broader social challenges such as promoting social cohesion. Um, I really look forward to exploring this topic further with such great panelists today and also to hear the thoughts of the audience later uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, Christelle, um, for the introduction. So as Christelle mentioned, my name is Lena Whitaker and I'm a director here at Eurocommerce and I'll be the moderator for today's session. And um, before we go on to introduce the panel, I'd like to just first of all invite our guest from the European Commission, Anna Carrero, to provide some insights on how the Commission is also elaborating on how businesses and um, vocational education institutes can work together. Um, Anna is a deputy head of unit in the vocational education and Training Director General of Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion of the European Commission and previously has been responsible for modernizing, uh, promoting the modernization of the labor market, skills and social protection systems in Spain. So Anna, please, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Many thanks for inviting me to this event. Uh, this, this is a very special week. As, as you were saying, we are putting the full spotlight on vocational education and training this week to promote it as an effective career and, and learning pathway. And all efforts at EU, national, regional and local level are very much welcome. So this event comes with the perfect timing. And this, this year, it is also embedded in the European Year of Skills as uh, vocational education and training is also aligned with the objectives that we are trying to achieve, which are basically to cater for the skills needed for the labor market, match people's aspiration with uh, labor market needs and more and better investments uh, in skills. So all this comes in a context where companies are struggling with recruitment. And uh, you already mentioned that, but we are very much aware of it in, in the commission many of which uh, are in the services sector. Uh, so you are not sometimes not finding the right skills uh, and, and this can be indeed the root cause uh, for some of these situations. So the, the last Eurobarometer that we had on skills, uh, there we identified that over 75% of SMEs find it difficult to find workers with the right, the right skills. And this of course uh, impacts innovation, productivity and, and growth. So. In this context, uh, we know that vocational education and training uh, can be key 
in addressing these skills shortages. And this can be achieved in many ways. Huh? First, uh, by making sure that there is the training offer that the labor market requires, huh? uh, by making use of skills intelligence tools and cooperating with social partners and businesses to identify these training needs. And, that you can envisage many ways of doing this. Second, by making sure young people about to choose learning pathways and also adults that may want or need to upskill and reskill are aware of the job opportunities certain learning pathways can bring. And this can be achieved uh, with solid guidance systems, both embedded in education and training systems and employment services in cooperation, of course, uh, with businesses. And finally, to make that really effective, work-based learning uh, programs are the most effective. We know that they are the ones that have uh, higher rates of labor market integration af after the programs. And this, of course, requires very close cooperation with, with businesses that need to make available places and also resources for uh, teaching and learning on the job in cooperation with uh, with training institutions. So these are my uh, my first uh, insights, but I would be glad to participate in the panel later to, to give you more details on what we are doing at EU level. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. I think it's great to hear that um, it is about collaboration and um, it's interesting to hear that you also see that work-based programs have good results as well. So if I now can just introduce very quickly the panel that is joining us today. Um, we have Thomas Wimsberger, who is a policy advisor at the EU Representation Austrian Federate Economic Chamber. Um, Diana Philip, who is a Deputy CEO and Chief Development Officer at Junior Achievement. Um, Raymond Liner, who is our Jobs and Skills Committee Chair at Eurocommerce, also um, at SPA. Anna, who you have um, just heard speak, and Amy, who was on our floor just earlier. So if I may have a very quick round, just so that we can also alert the audience that we have some time reserved for questions. So please feel free to um, to send these through the platform and um, we will hopefully have some time to pick these up. But Thomas, if I may just start with you then. Um, it's, it'd be interesting to understand from your perspective how at your level and, and where you're coming from at WKO, how you are involved in the development process of vocational education curricula. Is it something that's particularly challenging? And what is it from the company perspective that perhaps makes it a little bit more challenging? So thanks, thanks for having me. Um, you know, the in, in Austria, the dual education system is traditionally very strong. Many young people choose this path, which is positive. Um, and where we come in, uh, social partners traditionally have a very strong role in, in the process of creating uh, apprenticeship schemes and also in creating the curricula, updating them regularly. So usually if we hear, hear from, for example, hear from our companies um, that they need a certain uh, certain qualifications, we can talk with our counterparts, with the Chamber of Labor, the trade unions and also the ministries. Um, whether it's necessary to create uh, a new scheme and it's the negotiation mostly takes place between uh, social partners and the ministry is also on the table but their job is mostly to rubber stamp what we decided then and uh, we think that it's a very good way just to be flexible um, for example a couple of years ago there was a need to do more in e-commerce so we we uh, negotiated an apprenticeship scheme in e-commerce management and this is, uh, has had a huge uptake now we have uh, tripled in a couple of the numbers in a couple of years um, it's challenging uh, as many uh, everybody who knows who's involved in social partner discussions knows it's very challenging in the sense that it takes a long time. You don't have any quick wins, but uh, I think in the end, everybody is satisfied usually, and that's what's most important. Uh, we, have, of course, have different interests in the sense that our companies want more specialized uh, profiles. The, in general, the trade unions want more general ones so that people can um, move easier between the, the sectors, and we have to strike a compromise. Uh, but. It, the good thing is uh, that for us, and um, we represent our uh, members, every Austrian uh, company is a member of the Aust 
Austrian economic chamber, they have got a direct way of, it, uh, um, of addressing what they need. So if they think, okay, we need a, a new profile in uh, e-commerce, uh, they, can, they have a direct way of uh, uh, telling it to those uh, who decide in the end. And yeah, that's that's a very good way. And I, I, it also um, it's it's also what what Anna said. Uh, it's about cooperation in the end. You can't do any top down uh, things. It has to be together. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. And if I can just ask you one just small follow-up question as well. I mean, you mentioned a lot of the interaction also at, with governments and the social partners working together, but do you have a lot of interaction with small businesses as well? Uh, yeah, so we uh, represent all Austrian businesses. So whenever they, who, whichever member of us wants uh, to talk, tell, talk with us uh, can address it. And we also have got a, a system of internal co coordination. So if small businesses come um, and they suggest something, we also we always need to give uh, larger uh, companies also the, a way to say it's their, their part, uh, to, to express their opinion. And then we form an internal opinion within the Austrian Economic Chamber. So there's never, for, on the other hand, there's never, it's never that uh, large companies can suggest things and SMEs don't have a say. So it's always everybody who can uh, speak in. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear that it's a very large and collective um, process. Um, what I also just wanted to say, what I found very interesting, what you said is the flexibility, um, the flexibility that you have to adapt to change. And I presume also the drive in e-commerce was also linked very much to what we saw during the pandemic with shops being closed. And I think actually what Christelle may not have mentioned is that from the Eurocommerce perspective, we also see that 90% of growth will be driven by online by 2030. 30. So it is, of course, very important that there is this flexibility. And this brings me very nicely to um, Diana and um, your work at the moment as well, because you're working on quite an exciting project. Let's say it's called Skills for Retail, um, which is a forward looking approach um, that aims to also accelerate the transition that the retail and wholesale sector is going through. So I wondered if you can tell us a little bit more about where did the idea come from? Um, and why is this program unique and, and what is its real vocational educational training um, aspect? Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm Diana Philippe and I represent Junior Achievement, who are the largest education organization in Europe. We work with over 70,000 schools and vocational schools across Europe. So when we heard about the skill shortage, that there is a need to modernize training in the retail sector, and that there is no blueprint on the retail sector, we, we liked the challenge and we said, let's try to really build a stronger consortium that we can to put forward a proposal to the European Commission for a blueprint on skills for retail. So I'm pleased to see that we also have WKO and SPAR here on the panel, who are part of a consortium together with, with Eurocommerce. And we have 29 partners that we managed to bring around the table, representing eight countries. Eight of them are private sector partners, and 16 of them are NGOs, universities, vocational schools. So they will be all working together on this ambitious pro project, as you said, to fast track the triple transition in the retail sector. So we said, why not? Jumping on a biz ambition, but at the same time, we really want to understand the needs. So the lot will be focused on the needs analysis and WKO is helping us to, to lead that work inside the, the consortium to understand what are the needs out there before we come and propose uh, uh, the kind of content and, and curriculum that we want to see for the vocational training. And that one will be done also by experts from SkillNet Island and, and all the uh, uh, vocational training institutions involved in the consortium because we really wanted to bring the the best expertise around the table in order to really tackle the needs that are out there in the in the retail sector. So I'm very excited for these four years to come on this project because I saw a great momentum uh, when we kicked off the project at the beginning of September and everyone really saw the need on working in this project. We focus on three when we said that the triple transitions on three key elements. One was building resilience because we know that after COVID, the sector had been highly impacted. So we wanted to make sure we really build the necessary skills to have strong resilience uh, uh, 
for the sector and for the people being trained. We focus on digital because we know there is a need for online communication, online entertainment, online shopping, using new technologies, bringing AI into it and all this in order to really be much more equipped for, for the skills that are needed. And of course, we focus on the green. We need to reduce the carbon footprint and, and trying to integrate the green aspect inside the proposal. So we will be really looking at a revolutionary program that will hopefully transform in a way the, the vocational school system, looking at the triple transitions and coming up with modular, modular uh, courses that will be integrated with the vocational school system that will also be able to be run separately, individually, uh, and also will be certified at the, at the end. So you will say it's a big ambition. While we don't want to do it alone, we will be building a European Skills Alliance. Uh, we would like to have representatives from the sector in all the countries in Europe, not only in the eight that are participated in the, in the project. So I'm very grateful for being invited on this call because it's really an open call also for everyone who's been interested to, to join forces, uh, to, to reach out to us, to see how they can contribute and be part of this ambitious project that we set up. Thank you, Deanna. It's um, great to hear that it's um, all again about um, collaboration and um, working together. And it's quite ambitious, as you say, to try to get everybody around the table. Um, and maybe now I can just turn to a slightly different perspective. And Raymond, I can bring you in. You're the chair of the Eurocommerce Jobs and Skills Committee, um, which deals with a lot of social affairs on behalf of our members. Um, can you share some insights on, from your perspective, from an employer's perspective, what actions can be taken to enhance the quality and the perception of vocational education and training schemes? Mm, okay, thank you, Alina. Um, first of all, I would like to build on what Diana says, because uh, there is one, we should also show on, uh, look at the things that are really on the right track. And I think uh, that the program Pack for Skills is, is really fantastic, because it really will enable us to unify education within the European Union and to build blueprints for retail. That's very important. And I want to bring up another program I really appreciate. It's Erasmus that really allows us uh, to uh, have an international exchange in Europe and uh, bring people together within Europe. But there are things we would like to see to do, to have more. Um, of course, maybe uh, it's a point of view from Austria, but I think that the dual apprenticeship training uh, that is done in Austria is really a good model and we could, we could learn from it and we could uh, copy it in the other European countries. And another thing I would like to see is uh, maybe a kind of certificate. If you are a store manager, you, you are able to, uh, to do a graduation in a store manager certificate that allows you to work and travel through the European Union. And each employee knows what you know. So you have qualifications that are in connection with the blueprint. Uh, and so uh, it would be much easier for retailers, for example, to hire people from different countries within the EU. So I think uh, what we would like to see is um, more unified uh, and more uh, uh, education that really uh, builds uh, in, 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 a, in a common scheme so that we are uh, enabled to, to use the workforce within Europe. And I think it should be the aim uh, as European Union that we allow our uh, employees to travel through Europe and to, to start their, their jobs or do their jobs wherever they want. So these are the things we would like to see as retailers, just to mention some of the aspects. Thank you, Raymond. I think it's interesting to also hear that um, without mentioning the word single market is what you were implying. And um, I'm sure probably Anna might be able to come in with a few things that are already in the back of the Commission's mind about having to how you can use the single market to, to sort of help companies and, and build the bridges between the people that are coming through education and from and being able to represent their um what they've achieved and, and how it can be used and understood by other employers. So Anna, if I may just turn again to you as well. And one of the things that we also hear is that vocational education as a route is not necessarily always considered the most prestigious. There are certain perceptions of it that perhaps aren't as 
positively um, perceived, even though, as Raymond has just said, that there are great schemes that exist there in the EU. So I wondered what you your perception is as well and what strategies are being employed at the EU level to increase this perception. I mean, this week is one, I am sure, but please go ahead and then let us know. Thanks. No, indeed. I mean, I, I think the first step is to put forward the data and we try to do this with all the publications that uh, we, we release, be it the education and training monitor, the joint employment report and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and data shows that uh, VET leads to job opportunities. Huh? And this is based on evidence. Almost 80% of VET recent graduates find a job quickly with even a higher percentage for those who engaged in work-based learning or uh, apprenticeship programs. So, so com compared to um, uh, other uh, academic uh, uh, upper secondary students, uh, this is an advantage. No? And uh, so we try to raise awareness on this, of course, but at our level, it's it's also difficult to to act huh? because we have little competence in in this area so what we try to do is to encourage others uh, to act and this means uh communications campaigns basically they are important since 2016 we are running the european uh, vocational skills week uh, uh, and it's about raising awareness of the possibilities of, of vocational education and training in terms of learning, uh, that uh, vocational education and training can also lead to, to higher learning opportunities, but also in terms of jobs, as, as we were um, saying. And there is a new dimension of this, so us communicating in, in events like this and encouraging EU stakeholders to uh, organize events and so on and so forth. But the key element uh, of this uh, is, is the national, regional and local stakeholders, because those are the ones that are closer to the citizen. They are closer to young people uh, through education and training institutions. They are closer to adults uh, looking for a different job to upskill and reskills. And they are the ones that can really communicate to the citizen what is the labor market demanding? How can you get those skills uh, through VET? Huh? And um, and they, the, this, these actions can be uh, really effective. We encourage all these organizations working on the ground uh, to reflect what they are doing in our uh, communication campaign so they can upload their events and info sessions on, on the map we have available uh, that it's now combined with the European Year of Skills um, activities uh, just to give visibility and, and, and encourage uh, everybody to, to join forces and, and work on, on this. Um, now, of course, there is an additional element of, of uh, our policy priorities uh, now, the digital transition, the EU Green Deal, and we, we know that that uh, can really be instrumental in delivering the skills needed to uh, make the transition happen on the ground. And this can also be an element of attractiveness eh? also for young uh, and adults uh, to engage in, in training. Uh, last but not least, we are also uh, promoting the concept of vocational excellence. Eh? So vocational education and training is not second chance. Eh? They can, this can really uh, lead to excellence, to innovation, be key in uh, local uh, business and skills ecosystems. And uh, we are promoting these funding uh, networks of uh, centers of vocational excellence at EU level that can cooperate on specific topics and, and, and sectors and uh, make uh, vocational education and training really modern and, and fit to deliver the best skills uh, for these needs that the labor market uh, is, is asking for. Thank you, Anna. I think obviously um, maybe it's a little plug to show you the numbers that we're talking about in retail and wholesale. I think you're probably well aware, but it's 26 million people. So I'm hoping as the first private employer, there's obviously some attention being drawn to this sector that really probably can provide that bridge. Um, so it's very interesting to also hear this bottom up approach and also how it is also forward looking. I mean, I think we are very aware that the change and the, the way that retail is changing is so fast and so rapid that um, it's important that things are able to take advantage and look ahead as well. Um, attractiveness as well, I think, is certainly one of the issues that we also 
have, I think, from the perspective of retail and wholesale, it's not seen as the major opportunities that perhaps we would like it to have. So it's interesting to hear as well that everybody can work together to improve attractiveness. So if I may now turn to, to Amy, and um, obviously you mentioned at the beginning of this um, webinar that civil society is playing really a crucial role um, in shaping policies and advocating for the needs of people. So I wondered if you could just elaborate a little bit on any of initiatives or recommendations that you are working on, particularly for skill development in vocational education education and training, and also other activities of European Movement International. Yes, of course. Thank you for your question. Uh, it was very interesting to hear, especially what Anna was saying, because that ties um, up with a lot of things that we've been talking about at the uh, EMI, so uh, attractiveness, uh, in, uh, enhancing attractiveness, but also the changing of the mindset. So I'm going to let you know a little bit what we have been up to. Um, so we are very committed to advocating for policies and initiatives that support individuality, lifelong learning, the development just of a highly skilled uh, workforce. So maybe I'll talk about two of our most recent initiatives. Uh, first, in partnership with uh, Metro uh, AG, we organized a series of uh, three roundtables on the topic of indeed labor shortages uh, in Europe and the consequence consequences these uh, may have on specific economic sectors in Europe and around the globe, where we are very happy to have also Eurocommerce participate into them. And uh, those sessions brought uh, together social partners, civil society, policy experts from think tanks and academia, as well as uh, EU institutions. So we're very happy to have some people from the Commission also who participated. And uh, we developed uh, a report that I have here. <laughs> that, um, you know, like really uh, took the key takeaways and recommendations uh, and very much echo the recommendations that Anna talked about on comms campaigns to change mindsets to establish a, a culture of lifelong learning. Uh, another recommendation that standing from that report was really the need to ensure a better match between workers and uh, available jobs. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, uh, through the enhancing of mobility programs, Erasmus, but others across member states, also through bilateral agreements, um, putting in place a talent pool while making sure that it would not lead to a brain drain, brain drain offering quality uh, apprenticeships, mentorships, quality traineeships, something that the uh, European Youth Forum, one of our members, is very much pushing for it and that we all are greatly um, support. Um, also, providing career guidance for the youth before but also after. Uh, their labor market entry um, and lastly of course investing uh, in education and, and vocational training um, maybe i'll stop there for this specific report even though we, we had other recommendations also tackling the the green and uh, digital transitions but uh, i'll talk about another one of our initiatives so it's a policy position that we developed at emi uh, on post-pandemic recovery in europe where we very much focus on education uh, as well as skills uh, I'll focus on VET, considering this is our main topic of interest today. Uh, here we really call for a continuation of vocational education as a response to structural uh, changes in the labor market. And we call once again uh, for the EU to step up investments in the sectors, and especially in the exchange of apprentices across Europe. Uh, so multi-stakeholder fora, such as uh, the European Alliance for Apprenticeship, uh, need to be strengthened, adequately funded at the EU level. And more broadly, the EU needs to ensure that member states are allocating sufficient funding to inclusive, high quality education, training, and upskilling interventions. And uh, maybe my last word would be on something that we've been advocating for, uh, for quite a long time that the EU should always uh, use a broad definition of education that goes beyond formal education in schools and universities. And you should take further steps to increase the official recognition of non-formal and informal education so that really those experiences can be truly used for career development. Thank you. Thank you. It seems like it's um, been quite busy in a lot of projects that you've, you've covered with obviously this year of skills as well as a good way to look at where the labour market shortages are and actually what's needed as well. So thank you for that. Um,
I just want to now just turn before we um, come to questions from the audience, and it is a reminder now to those that are listening as well to please to, to add your questions and we will take some time to, to respond to you. But if I can turn to our panelists again and just having listened to everything that are, um, has been said, what do you think that the EU could do to support associations or companies in developing more vocational education and training schemes? And maybe if I start with Thomas. Thank you. Um, so I think the, my message would be just to, to all the institutions involved, like to build on what's already there. Um, it to not forget when we're talking about VET um, that we have got many countries and we've got very uh, diverse uh, schemes and this is uh, these are long traditions and there are reasons usually why um, it's done the way it's done and I think uh, for example Anna and DG Ample in general we don't need to tell them that they know uh, the the different uh, schemes or systems but now that this which is a good thing uh, the topic of skills uh, has become a very, very horizontal uh, topic. Many people are involved, more people than before, and they need also to develop um, the necessary sensibility for the, the diversity of the systems. Thank you. I think diversity is definitely something I can hear in your answers. So maybe I can also turn to Diana now as well. And I wonder what from your perspective, especially I know that you're at the beginning of a big project as well, that what's made you realize in the process what's needed. Well, first of all, I think putting the spotlight on skills and having this year the European Year of Skills is definitely helped a lot and is really connecting the industry with the vocational schools and the, the world of education. And maybe that's something I wanted to, to say. We really appreciate when the European Commission in the funding scheme of Erasmus really called out that uh, in each country where you implement activities, you have to have industries and educational uh, uh, players as well. So in the eight countries where we have, we have eight private sector partners in eight vocational schools and academia in order to be able to close the gap between the two, because that's really key to make sure that the world of work and the world of uh, education really understands what are the gaps out there and what the educational system needs to do in order to get young people trained for the future of jobs. We know that there are a lot of uh, opportunities and challenges out there, but I think by suggesting this kind of collaborations in very concrete with the different funding schemes that has been very good move forward and uh, it's really helping engaging the academia although it takes much longer to get them to convince them to join but we did manage and i think that we see that this is a great model to be replicated in the future and another one where i think we need support from the eu is to allow for flexibility in the school system to really adopt new modernized curriculum in order to allow for what's out there in the world of work and what are the needs that they need to adapt the new programs. So if programs that are coming, skills for retail would be one, but many others that are coming out of these blueprints, it afterwards can be integrated into, into the curriculum, then we will see much more pickup and much more uh, young people being ready and prepared for the world of work and, and uh, will have the necessary skills because when we are designing this new program, we are really designing for the needs that are out there in the world of work. And what I didn't mention before, it's outside the skills for retail, we also anticipate to see young people placed into jobs. So we want to see this close collaboration much stronger between the world of education and the world of work. And I really, I really like also what Anna was saying, all the focus put on, on recognition, on the relevance, on the collaboration, it's really good. And I, I'm grateful because European Commission already came to us and they said there are some partners that wants to join Skills for the Retail, have a chat with them and we were really, really pleased to see how we can in, uh, integrate them and collaborate with them as well. So I think this kind of recognitions, communication campaigns, and as you mentioned, really putting the spotlights on the great, good pra practices, that, that's great as well. So probably I could go on, but I think these are some of the key key elements I wanted to, to spot out because uh, it's really making a difference. 
great. No, I think it's important, as you say, it's a dialogue and it sounds like a very hands-on um, process that uh, having to speak and, and maybe not so much convince, but just raising awareness. So um, I think it sounds like a big effort, but definitely worth it. Um, so that these parallel tracks of education and what the world of work um, will continue as doesn't continue in parallel, they come together. So it's very interesting to have these insights. Um, I wondered, Anna, I don't know if you have any reflections um, on what you've just heard and sort of recommendations. Let's say there's a bit of a wish list towards the commission. Um, feel free to, to share some thoughts now and then we can quickly move to some questions we're getting in from the audience. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting points. Uh, many things point to uh, some of our activities, things that we are already doing. I mean, we also need to be aware that uh, at EU level, as we don't have competence uh, in terms of education and training, we have a limited number of tools. Huh? So we can put forward policy guidance huh? to, to share our vision so uh, people can follow uh, developing useful tools and evidence that could be of use for practitioners, facilitating the sharing of experience and making funds available. And I think we have worked in all these dimensions so far. I would I would point to three key tools that I think are worth sharing uh, with uh, our participants so they can maybe feel inspired and uh, follow uh, these, these networks and, and projects. So first is the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. Uh, some, some people already mentioned in the discussion, it's a network that um, comprises education and training providers, businesses, social partners, policymakers cooperating all towards providing more and better apprenticeships. And we organize um, uh, workshops, webinars, events, and I think it's a useful source for cooperation, uh, EU cooperation, and also for uh, knowledge sharing. So I encourage you to join. Then we have, of course, the Pact for Skills also mentioned. It's about joining forces uh, so we can upskill and reskill the workforce in key industrial sectors. So that's it also worth checking out uh, because it's a good source for cooperation in the sector. And then the Centers of Vocational Excellence. So I, I mentioned that these are international networks of vet centers, businesses, research, universities working together on a specific fields. It could be uh, water management, industry 4.0, urban greening, but also uh, the, the, the commerce sector. And uh, we have uh, regular calls every year under the Erasmus Plus uh, program guide. So uh, you could check them out and, and see if uh, this could be a useful avenue for your sector. And of course, check out all the funding oppor uh, opportunities that are on the table, not only Erasmus+, Plus, but also the European Social Fund and the Recovery and Resilience Facility are investing a lot on vocational education and training programs, uh, but these are managed at uh, national and regional level. So you should check out the funding opportunities at the level of the national authorities and see if there is anything um, that could be of use for your sector at, at, at that level because the, the, the amounts of investments uh, through these tools are, are really very significant. So that, that would be my suggestion. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. And, and maybe if I may, because one of the things that you, you mentioned just then is that there's, there is money available, there is support available. Um, but also what we sometimes hear on the, on the Eurocommerce side as well is a concern that these are a minefield to understand, particularly when you get down to the regional and the local level. And um, I wondered if there was anything that is working now to try and ease that barrier or it's only happening really at the national level. Um, and one thing that we also are quite interested in is that we obviously in our membership have a large number of national associations which then have the local connection and we always feel that this connection at that local level would also help the people that may be looking particularly the SMEs or um, the smaller companies as well and not necessarily just the small and um, to help them understand where this money could come from where they could actually take up opportunities like the recovery and resilience funds. So I wondered what you were doing or whether you had any reflections on that kind of, let's say the local connection and how that could be built. Yes, these are very interesting questions. Uh, so uh, on the first one, in terms of simplification, 
well, just, just for you to understand, these tools um, like the Recovery and Resilience Facility and the European Social Fund, they, they are negotiated with, with member states, the main areas of investment at EU level, but then it's, it's really up to the member state to, to define how to make them happen uh, on the ground. And sometimes it's, it's not even for the national authorities, but the regional or the local, depending on the, on the type of interventions that they are envisaging and also on the governmental setup uh, of, of each country. So we have indeed uh, embedded uh, some simplification uh, rules uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, philosophy in the regulations at EU level, but uh, it's also very difficult to manage and, and, and to see what they are really doing on the ground under these rules, because of course we need to make sure that they comply what with our regulation, but then there are other decisions that are really up to them. And, and we know that, unfortunately, sometimes it's it's quite difficult and it could be a bit daunting uh, for an individual, a small company to, to understand everything that it's required. But uh, your second question was very, very interesting. Uh, I, I think there could be some space uh, at now national level to to make this support available indeed i mean this is this is something we are not doing at eu level and i don't think an a new organization uh, working on, on the sector would be the best place either because every system in every country is different so there should be really someone at national level being able to, to explain how these tools are being deployed um, and, and what would be what would be the opportunities first for SMEs because not everything is available to SMEs or to companies. Sometimes uh, the target groups are um, NGOs or uh, public organizations. So it really depends on on the tool. Huh? Uh, but this is indeed a, a very it would be a very useful tool to put this uh, service available for, for SMEs through the chambers of commerce or through associations uh, that are uh, well placed. And, and in this respect, you could even approach uh, the managing authorities of these funds um, in, in the member states to, to talk about it. And uh, maybe they can help you understand what opportunities are available and how to uh, trickle down the details for the SMEs uh, in practice. And there may be even some funding available to to provide this service. So I encourage you to explore, but the, the contact points should be the managing authorities of these funds uh, in the member state at national and regional level. Thank you, Anna. I think you've given us some homework there, and I'm sure I think many of our members are aware of this, but it shows that more needs to be done to, let's say, not have the parallel tracks again, where you have funding being potentially available, but the people that can help shape exactly what it could be used for, um, not having that dialogue that we've also um, we've pushed for. I mean, obviously, as well, it's very important that the idea and the perception as well is quite interesting of, of retail and wholesale. And, and Raymond, I don't know if you wanted to just bring in something on this point as well about how it can also drive forward a conversation about opportunities that may not be appreciated um, in retail and wholesale. I think you just need to unmute, Raymond, sorry. I did it. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it's about the reputation of retail. Uh, so I see it. We are, of course, in competition with other industries. And retail really, uh, to some extent, still suffers from a bad image. Uh, and uh, I think we sh could have ideas or we could uh, do something about it. And we could uh, start, I don't know, some initiatives in order to promote retail. Retail is not only uh, a part where you can do a vocational training, it's also a sector where you can could do your own business. You could become a retailer your own. We have 700 retailers in, in Austria and they are quite successful. So that's just another aspect I wanted to stress. Uh, beside the, the education, vocational training, uh, it's about the industry. So how can we really promote retail as, as a good employer uh, and uh, as, a, as an attractive industry. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any uh, ideas or comments on that. Thank you. Um, Amy, and um, perhaps you can um, take the floor. Do you have a comment on this yes. one? 
Uh, actually, so as I mentioned, we did like those uh, several roundtables where we had people from the industry coming in and kind of really tackling this problem of uh, job attractiveness and uh, how to retain the workers because, well, I mean, you know the, the circumstances. I mean, it was not only about wholesale and retail, even though there was also, like, but I think there are communalities that could potentially also work. So we came up with uh, some recommendations also stemming from this discussion. Uh, on how it did to enhance the job attractiveness. Uh, and for example, there was a, a recommend or an advice to really diversify job offers, uh, provide more flexibility, provide formal, non-formal trainings, short and long trainings, uh, really adopt a targeted approach to the more vulnerable workers and those less likely to take uh, up trainings and here what was uh, mentioned was like, for example, people coming from a migratory background, uh, low income workforce, you, young people, women, uh, also elderly people. Um, I think another recommendation was uh, counting trainings as a paid working time. Um, and also one other thing was to change the narrative on migration, both in the politics, but also in the regulation to facilitate uh, migrant uh, integration. Thank you. I think it's also perhaps then again more homework for us to ensure and perhaps we could work together with the Commission on this is to raise the profile a little bit of all the different types of opportunities that are out there, including, let's say, the ones that we've already mentioned. It's it's a vast number of youth and on youth employment, lots of flexibility, part time work and um, also working with different communities and members of the communities to integrate them, whether it's migrants or those um, that may only need want to do something on the other side of their um, education as well. So it's a huge mix um, and we should be using this to our advantage. Um, but maybe I can just with it, before we come towards the final close, um, I heard that best practices in communication now is really, really the focus. And I think this week that we have is a really good opportunity to share this. So maybe on two fronts, having listened to what's been said, I mean, has anyone got any good ideas or what they've seen that they thought was a really good way to promote vocational education or what perhaps is been done to really promote retail and wholesale as well as the opportunity that it presents. So Diana, I think you, you look like you're ready to come in. I'm happy to come in on this because we've seen some great best practices when the, the retail get engaged into the education and really offer the opportunities you talked about before to the young people because many times they do not know what are the different opportunities in a job and or in a company? So that's why if we can go back and really show to them some of the campaigns that we've been doing across Europe, which proved to be very successful with the job shadow days where young people are going to shadow uh, the employees on different days that they are running and they explain the different kind of skills and jobs and different spectrums of, of, of uh, uh, Opportunities that are in different companies. So that's one thing that really proved very, very successful because it opened their eyes and really understands what the sector is offering. We also done reverse mentoring in which we are getting young people to advise the, the companies. And that has also been very interesting because you put them in the shoes of the, of the employers and then they think it through for themselves. This is something that I would like to do. I would like to practice. So I think engagement closer with the, with the young people so that they see those, those opportunities young, like when they are young, that's really, really helpful. And the earlier, the, possible, the better, because when it's too late, when they are at end vocational level or university level, it might be sometimes too late because maybe they made up their mind. So engaging the companies as early as possible into the education system is really proved to be very successful for, for making sure we open those opportunities for the young people. Thank you. I think this is a very good positive note perhaps to end on um, as well before I pass over the floor ready to for Christelle to sort of get share our last few reflections. I mean, starting early, I think I see that the education already does start early with people already talking, let's say, what do you want to be when you grow up? But actually seeing actually in practice what it could mean and um, perhaps challenging the ideas and the presumption that something might not be for you um, and involving companies is really a great way forward. And I think vocational education definitely has this potential. Um, also, if 
its reputation can be built up and given its visibility that um, certainly all this best practice exchange is, is heading in the right direction. So thank you, my panelists, for such an excellent and interactive discussion. I'm hoping that our audience has learned quite a lot and um, is hopefully going away with some great ideas and knows where to contact us. Um, please do respond on LinkedIn and our websites um, to contact us if you have any follow-up questions. So Christelle, if I may um, pass over to you um, to, to close the session today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina, and a very, very warm uh, thank you to our, our panelists for a fascinating discussion. Fascinating discussion on how to build momentum, highlighting a real challenge, a business need, and, um, and the need to also help everyone through the res build resilience and, uh, and invest in the digital and green transition. The discussion as you have said, Lina has highlighted a number of points. And if I can recap a few of them. Uh, first of all, the importance of raising awareness and building up the data sets to make informed decisions. Facilitating the exchange of experience between countries, between businesses, between organizations. Collaboration and working together is, is, is essential. No one will do this alone. Preparing young people better for the world of work has also come up as a key uh, as a key element in the discussion. Also highlighting the diversity, inclusion, the opportunity of building experience abroad uh, to enrich your curricula and uh, and transfer skills. Engaging companies early is also very important, and in doing this, we should be looking at both large and small businesses because everybody is playing a key role in, um, in our economy. Uh, a, a specific word uh, on the attractiveness of our sector, which was uh, also highlighted as, as a challenge, uh, and, and also um, perhaps as, um, as, as homework for, for, for us in, in Eurocommerce and together with our members. So being seen as a, an opportunity for career development, um, is, is also quite quite a bit of a challenge. In, in retail and wholesale, the study that we did last year together with McKinsey, it highlighted that the challenge is particularly important, uh, not just because the sector is an important stakeholder in the European economy, uh, but also uh, the importance of skills, the skills challenge to uh, support the digital and sustainability transformation on the way. And the numbers are quite striking. Um, our sector altogether would need to invest up to 35 billion euros by 2030. It would have to reskill, upskill up to 13 million employees and hire 1.5 million new people every year to manage the transition. So the challenge is real big. I hope the webinar uh, was only the beginning of the conversation, a conversation to be continued on anticipating and identifying the skills gaps, addressing the skills shortage, finding the funding necessary, and addressing other barriers. This is critical for the digital and sustainability transformation of our sector but also altogether for the economy, for building resilience and strengthening our economic competitiveness. Again, I'd like to thank you all for your participation and in particular, our audience. We look forward to continuing to engaging with you and pursuing the dialogue. I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Thank you.